guys, let's talk about respiratory priorities. So this is something that can be really confusing. So I figured I would make a PowerPoint to try to better explain um, what respiratory priorities are and how you can differentiate them. So most people know that we focus on ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, but you know most people don't really understand really what does that mean and how can we break this down? And because airway and breathing actually break down into a lot of different other priorities beneath them. So how can we look at these for the disorders that we've just learned about? So, um, you know, the top priorities for respiratory problems, you know, the most common ones are about airway, keeping like an open airway, breathing, like the breathing pattern, oxygenation, um, the ability to get oxygen in into your tissues to get perfusion, and then activity tolerance, which is how well that you are tolerating, you know, just activities of daily living, brushing your teeth, um, eating, etc. And I'm going to kind of break these down a little bit more. So let's talk about the priority patent airway. When I say airway is my priority, what do I mean? Because I'm sure you heard this and you're, you know, you're professor, and especially if your clinical professor's me, I'm really annoying. And I'm like, but what do you mean? But what are you going to do about it? So what does it mean to be worried about airway? Airway, when uh, we say airway is a priority, we're talking about the openness or patency of the airway. Um, and so, you know, questions to use, these are questions to ask yourself, like, does this apply to my patient? Um, you want to ask, like, are there airway, um, throat and lungs open? So think of things like where they might not be like anaphylaxis. If I started having swelling and other um, problems where my, like literally my airway is closing, my number one priority is going to be a patent airway because it's literally closing off. Um, another consideration is if they need to cough, are they able to? Like, do they have a gag reflex? Because that's going to also put them at risk. Like, even if I'm someone who have um, has a open airway, like there's nothing closing it. If I have a whole bunch of mucus or sputum and I can't cough it up, then that's going to put me at risk for aspiration. It's also going to put me at risk for closure of my airway, or I should say even closure. I start blockage of my airway. Um, you know, like I mentioned, can they cough up sputum? Do they have a lot of sputum or thick sputum and have trouble getting it out? Um, and the other consideration is like, how awake are they? Because even if a, I don't have a lot of mucus um, and uh, I have an open airway, what if I'm just not awake enough where I'm going to just be really at high risk to like literally aspirate my own secretion? So like, am I awake enough to sit up if I need to vomit? Because if not, that puts a patient at risk for, you know, needing, um, having issues with being able to be awake enough to support or protect their airway. And then we also can also look at oxygen saturation because usually if someone's having like a narrow airway, like a mucus is blocking it or it's not completely patent there, maybe they're getting swelling from anaphylaxis, um, then we're going to be looking um, at like lower oxygen saturations. So I'm going to have on a later slide kind of what these connect to, but when you're thinking airway patency that we're usually talking about like anaphylaxis or asthma can get to the point where their airway closes off and things like that as well. Um, so you really want to think about the ones where things are closing off um, you know, or um, think of things like we talked about where like there was a lot of sputum. And so like asthma, COPD, um, we talked about bronchiectasis, which has that really thick sputum, even pneumonia can be at risk um, if they have a lot of it. It really just depends. But like as a whole, when, I, when you think about patent airway, I want you to think about disease processes like anaphylaxis and asthma, where things actually completely close off and they cannot keep things open. So how about adequate breathing? What am I talking about when I'm talking about adequate breathing? When I'm talking about adequate breathing, I'm talking about a breathing pattern. I'm talking about your muscle use and your gas exchange. So you want to look at what their breathing is like. So some questions you may want to look at or things you may want to assess is what is their respiratory rate? If I'm having a really, really fast kipnic breathing pattern. Um, I do not have an adequate breathing pattern because I'm breathing off too much CO2. I'm anxious. I may not be oxygenating well. I'm not taking time to inhale and exhale. So I can have um, issues um, because of that. Um, look at their, um, their chest. Are they using extra muscles to breathe? Um, are they complaining of shortness of breath? It seems like they're working really hard. Um, is it hard for them to breathe when they're exerting? Like, is there something that's not working with their pattern? Um, even at rest, is it hard for them to breathe? Really focus on their breathing. What are they doing with their breathing? Are they using muscles? Um, do they look like they're struggling? Are they nasal flaring? Are they using their belly to breathe? That means they're using like everything. Like, 
normally we just, uh, what do you call it, um, we can breathe pretty passively, but if I'm having to work really hard, my clavicles, my shoulders, my um, rib, around my rib cage and my diaphragm, you'll see my abdomen, like my, all of my muscles get together to try to make breathing happen. So how hard is this patient working? Um, you know, is their breathing affecting their ability to eat, et cetera? Um, so we really want to look at their breathing pattern. So with, adic uh, with patent airway, it's all about, is my airway open? With breathing pattern, it's like, what does my breathing look like? Am I working really hard? Um, you know, is, um, uh, what do you call it? is there signs that I'm really, um, you know, like um, my body is uh, not probably oxygenating well because I'm working so hard to breathe. Like I'm using so many muscles or like something's just not working. So when you're thinking, you know, like that someone does not have a good breathing pattern, think like COPD, like they have that really poor gas exchange because of their disease process and are gonna have problems adequately breathing. Asthma, they have problems adequately breathing. Pneumonia, they can have problems adequately breathing. Um, and a lot of like with pneumonia, it's because remember they have that chest pain um, that makes it really hard to take a deep breath. And if I can't take a deep breath, I'm really not only at risk for complications, but I don't have an effective breathing pattern. I cannot get that gas exchange happening like I, I want or need it to happen. Now let's talk about oxygenation, because a lot of times it seems like everything we've talked about, well, patent airway is oxygenation, breathing patterns, oxygenation. But sometimes some people have just a problem where they're just not oxygenating. So we really want to look at like, you know, things like that are very specific, you know, it's the ability to get oxygen to the body. So what, we want to look at what is their oxygen saturation? And then we want to look at their skin, go to the rest of the body, because I can sit there and I can look at someone's oxygen saturation and say, oh, hey, it looks good. But how's their perfusion? Even if I'm getting oxygen in what like what do my fingertips look like what temperature are they um, what color are they what's my capillary refill these are all signs of is oxygen actually getting to my tissues because at the end of the day you think the goal is to get oxygen to the lungs but it's actually to get it to the tissues and if I'm not um, if I'm not getting enough oxygen in the first place all the oxygen is going to go is to my major organs in here but if I'm not oxygenating well my fingers my toes they're the first thing to get cut off they're the first one to lose their priority and um getting um, oxygen because as much as I'd really like my fingers and toes to have oxygen, it's much more important for my heart and my brain to get the oxygen it needs first. Um, so um, as a whole, I'm really looking for perfusion here, you know, and really also look at the patient. Are they complaining of shortness of breath and having other symptoms like that? So when you think about who has a priority of adequate oxygenation, think of people that have problems getting oxygen in. That's going to be things like pneumonia. In pneumonia, there's so much junk in the bottom of the lungs from all that bacteria or virus or fungus, whatever is going on. There's all this junk that builds up that um, they can't get oxygen in. So they commonly have an adequate oxygenation problem. Um, we call it um, patients that have asthma attacks. They have the airway patency issue where their airway closes, but they also can't get oxygen in as well um, because of the blockages and things like that, that airway closing off. So adequate oxygenation can be a problem for them as well. Uh, but as a whole, um, think um, a lot of like the infectious disease process, the inflammatory disease processes where stuff in the lower part of the lungs is making it hard to get oxygen to get in. Um, it's usually most of what we think about when we think about adequate oxygenation. Now let's talk about activity tolerance. And so this might go, this goes a lot. We talked about some of this with breathing pattern, but activity tolerance has a lot to do with the ability to breathe and do activity at the same time. So it's my ability to sit here and talk a million miles a minute um, while still breathing at the same time, which many people actually think I don't breathe, but it's a common fallacy. I actually am breathing right now, I promise. Um, <clears throat> but effectively, you know, it's not just about exercise, like being able to like, you know, run a 5k and keep up with your breath. It's about even just being able to do things as simple as brush your teeth, um, eat your food, um, walk to the next room, that kind of stuff. Um, so we want to ask them, um, like kind of see like the things that we would be looking for in this patient is they're going to be saying like, hey, it doesn't take much before I get tired or short of breath, or, you know, even simple activities are really hard. Like, you know, some things are going to be challenging for anyone, but if it's challenging for me to lift a fork up and bring it to my mouth, that's pretty, a pretty big sign that I'm just not tolerating anything. Um, we want to ask them about how has it gotten better or worse and what makes it better or worse? What are the things that are really um, starting to kind of get in the way there? 
And is it harder in the morning or at night? Because especially for people that have activity tolerance issues, they commonly have, um, you know, sometimes they're more tired at night uh, because they've been working so hard or they've been doing so much during the day. It just depends on the patient though. So why did I try to stress you out with all of this? Because you may be saying like, oh my God, which one's which? What are you talking about, lady? Like, I kind of get what you're saying, but not really. If you're thinking like, oh, thank God she said that, here's the answer. Like, this is, this is something that's meant to be more fluid. I really want you to just understand like what some of these big things, what they mean, because commonly people get them confused. So for example, um, you know, like um, if there was like a test question or an NCLEX question that was asking about like, hey, what's the priority for a certain patient? A lot of times people um, will get mixed up what's an airway issue and what's a breathing issue. And so if you can kind of, um, you know, break these down and separate them more by like, what are they really telling us? What are they about? You can uh, really start to better understand them. And so a great place to go, and I have a picture of it here, is if you go to the back of your book, um, in the nursing diagnosis, or sorry, the nursing management section, um, most large diseases like major ones will have this section and you can go under nursing diagnoses and you want to look this. So look, um, you can see that a lot of these have multiple. So this is the one from your book about pneumonia. It says impaired gas exchange, that's breathing pattern. Um, impaired breathing, that's breathing pattern and, and activity tolerance. So this has multiple of them, um, but it's just to better understand like what's gonna help this patient. Keep in mind that like there shouldn't be nursing diagnoses on the NCLEX and things like that. So it's not about being able to label a nursing diagnosis, but it's more about understanding what's gonna help this patient. So like, for example, if I think that, um, uh, what do you call it? If I thought that COPD was all just about oxygenation, like, oh, I just need oxygen. If I give them oxygen, they'll be okay. I'm going to mi really miss the bar and probably miss a lot of questions on an exam because I don't really understand what the problem is. So um, I'm, I kind of broke down here a couple examples. Like we talked about airway patency, think anaphylaxis. Now, this is not the only example. This is not the only disease that airway patency is, is about, but I just want to kind of help you to connect this. So when you're thinking about airway patency, remember, think about that closed, constricted airway where um, we caught nothing can get in. So pretty much um, it's saying how open is the airway? Um, is, the, is the patient's, and this is kind of the, the order that we, you know, kind of go in is, is that, um, you know, first and foremost, more than anything, I have to have an open airway or I can't help anybody. So that should be your main priority for any patient um, that has a problem with airway patency. Um, we caught breathing pattern, um, think COPD, like how they have that difficulty with that gas exchange and they have to do those special, like the purse lip breathing and the tripod position in order to help them to, um, uh, what do you call it, um, adequately get like better gas exchange and stuff like that. So that's going to like my pro top priority for COPD is going to be, of course, they have some airway patency issues like getting that mucus up. But first and foremost, like I can help them by helping with their breathing patterns. That's what's going to help them the most. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about oxygenation is a lot about infections and stuff like that when junk gets in the bottom of the lungs and kind of gets in the way. So think pneumonia and tuberculosis. I want to make sure that these patients are adequately oxygenated. Um, and then activity intolerance, a lot of them, pneumonia can be activity intolerance, COPD can be activity intolerance, asthma can be activity intolerance, but it's any disease process that makes life hard because it's hard to breathe. Um, so um, like I said, many of these will have multiple of these issues. And again, I'm not, hopefully I'm not confusing you more than when you um, first got here, but I just wanna help you to better understand what's gonna help this patient. And so um, really when you're like looking at these, just breaking down like, okay, if I, if a, like if, if we gave you a question that said, how are you gonna help a client with their breathing pattern? And you say, give oxygen. Oxygen doesn't help with the breathing pattern, but it does help with adequate oxygenation. Or if we said, hey, um, what, uh, you know, what is gonna help with activity intolerance, like energy conservation, things like that, like really understanding and getting to the core of how do each of these relate to how I can help this patient? So how can I help with airway patency? How can I help with breathing pattern? How can I help with adequate oxygenation? How can I help with activity intolerance? Don't get too worked up with like, okay, well, is breathing or oxygenation more important in this and stuff like that? Because um, it's going to depend on the situation. We're not going to give you that tough of questions and the NCLEX shouldn't be that tough either. 
but it's more just about understanding about like, and, and this is maybe a better way and way I should have said it earlier is really just try to focus on, okay, if a patient has an airway patency issue, what can I do? What medications do I give? What can I do as the nurse? Breathing pattern, what medications can I give? What can I do as the nurse? Adequate oxygenation, medications, what can I do as the nurse, et cetera. You kind of get the point here. So you really want to be able to see how can you help with each of these different priorities? Because like I mentioned, like with asthma, it, it's like asthma is like all of these things pretty much has all of these priorities. But for a patient with asthma, how am I going to help them with their airway patency versus how am I going to help them with their breathing pattern versus how am I going to help them with adequate oxygenation? So there's different um, interventions that we can do for each of these priorities to help depending on the disease process. So like <clears throat> um, for anaphylaxis, First and foremost, I'm going to get their airway open. I'm going to give them epinephrine. I'm going to give them bronchodilators. I'm going to give them corticosteroids. But they also have a problem with adequate oxygenation because they have that closure of the airway. So I'm going to probably give them oxygen to help support them. Um, so you kind of see how like there's different medications or treatments, even though it's the same disease, but depending on the priority. So hopefully this broke this down a little bit to you know better understand these different respiratory priorities. And again, if I confused you more, um, you can just turn me off. I go away really easily. There's a stop button and I disappear forever. <laughs> so anyway, um, hope this was helpful and I'll see you next time.